Howdy y'all. Thank you for joining me today for another reveal of my top 100 board games for 2022. I do this list every year. This is the first one I'm doing on camera. Basically using this just so that I can look back and see what I felt or had to say about the games. But also hoping to extend the same thing that I get from other top 100 lists where I'm basically... I like watching those to see if they may talk about some games that might interest me or just to compare games from other people's hobbies and whatnot or from other people's lists also because maybe we share some of the same likes so if you see some that we see we seem to share the same about maybe you'll find some new games that you haven't tried before or been interested in trying and maybe this will be something to help you get towards that. This it was supposed to be, I was going to do the top 40 with Jammin' Outdoors' Brian Absher due to scheduling issues and then also not sure how long a video would be of us doing 15 and 15 than 10. I figured it's better just to do one because these have already all been an hour because I end up going and talking about some of my favorite games and I've noticed they're getting longer. So I figure the top 10 we're going to really want to talk about because we're going to want to talk about our games. But then also, that way if the 11 through 25 ends up being a long video, we don't have to sit there and try to reschedule or refigure out how to shorten that video. So we'll try to get that one out there and hopefully be able to get that together here. But with him, we will be doing 25 through 11 and then we'll do one that's going to be our top 10 board games now our lists are different also is the reason i wanted to put them on there is because mine i only rate and judge on games that i played as of december the 31st or january the 1st of this year so any games i played after or any games i played this year won't be on my list whereas he does pretty much always constantly has his list updating and as he plays new games and whatnot. Figured I also gives another take on it. That way if mine ain't your taste. Maybe his will be. But the last thing I'll talk about. Is how I came about this list. Just in case you didn't watch the other videos. Is I did this with Pub Meeple. I rated over three to 400 games. Basically did it 10 times. Because I was noticing outliers and whatnot. Just because of the way the program works. Did it 10 times. That gave me an average. And so far, I've been pretty happy about where everything's been at. So, haven't really seen any weird complaints. Seen some surprises. But I think in the end, at the end, it, I'm pretty happy where I'm seeing things lie. Because it does seem like a lot of like the randomness games are all in the same spot and whatnot. So, now, I also have not looked at this list. So, I know what my top 10 are because I couldn't help myself on that. But I also am revealing as I go just as kind of a surprise to me but I kind of know what should be in these because these are the ones that I do know I like these games so these are the ones I would always pick and just by already seeing what's been on the list it's like okay I know I like this game a little bit more so it should be on here but without much ado let's get right into it and find out what my 26 through 40 are my number 40 no surprise that it's on my list because it's actually been kind of around it's, uh, since I played it. And it's also one of my favorite mechanics, deck building mechanic. Now it's had multiple iterations of it. That is Thunderstone. It started out as Thunderstone. I played it then and I also played Thunderstone Advanced. And then now Thunderstone Quest. They're pretty much all the same. With Thunderstone, you are able to put Thunderstone Advanced mixed in, and you can use the same cards. With Thunderstone Quest, they changed the way the dungeon kind of works. It just feels a little different. They put some miniatures in it, which really aren't needed, but I guess just adds to it a little bit. I'm not sure if you... I don't think you can actually add in... I'm sure you probably could, actually, the old Thunderstone stuff. But there's so much Thunderstone Quest stuff out, out at the moment... Most, I want to say 75% of it, I own it all, but 75% of it I haven't even used yet because I'm still just playing the stuff in the base box. And I don't really do the scenarios. Now, I do want to try, and I know it was one of the other expansions I haven't gotten to yet, where instead of having the cards out on the table, that that's the only cards you can buy, of having an, a deck of random 
what's in the market. So I do want to try that. Uh, I think that will, I don't know if it'll make it go up anymore or less, because this game's been kind of all over the place. It was number 50 last year, 25 the year before that. It does have one cool mechanic I haven't really seen in other deck building games yet, or if I have, I just haven't put two and two together that that's what it does, is the way you destroy or cull things from your deck in this one is really you get characters, which are start out as like level zeros, and they get to level into a type of character, like a warrior or a priest or a rogue or a wizard, and then you can level those cards up into bigger versions of those cards. So it's kind of cool the way as you level them up, you're culling out those out of your deck, but you still want to get the right equipment and the right light so you can go down in the dungeon, but also be able to equip your warriors or your wizards with spells and whatnot. Just kind of a unique little thing that I thought was kind of cool back when I first ran into Thunderstone, which made me just buy everything. But that was also right when I had just found deck building games. So I knew this one was one that me and my group, when we found deck building games, we just loved playing this game. Almost as much I did. It was, we found it at the same time as Dominion and Legendary and all that. And this was just one of the ones that we always enjoyed playing. It is kind of funny that I didn't realize, like, now we're seeing these hybrids where you're using cards so that you can worker place onto a board. Thunderstone was kind of already doing that in the past. What it was doing was just, you needed certain amounts of light so you could go further in the dungeon so you could fight certain monsters. I mean, it's kind of not really the worker placement angle of it, but just the idea that they were already starting a hybrid look at other ways to use deck building games at the time when deck building games were just doing deck building games of just shuffle cards or buy cards and put them in your discard so you can shuffle them in and play. So this was one of those ones that started branching out to be a hybrid different type of game. I just didn't really realize it till after playing Lost Runes of Arnak one day and talking about the Understone Quest that, oh yeah, you know, it's kind of just like you need these certain things to be able to place you kind of needed certain things in order to do this and this. So it was just kind of interesting the way I noticed that. And this was kind of like the grandfather into that. But that's number 40, Thunderstone. My number 39, I was actually surprised I liked this game. Just because of one of the mechanics in it. And that game is Carson City. This I would call a western game, but it's more of a western land grab game or point salad game. The mechanic that's in there that I don't really like is usually that action, action selection where you're going to be taking a certain character and that's going to give you something unique that you get to do, which I do like that, but I don't, I'm not really big and keen on that type of stuff where it's like, man, I got to choose a card and because I chose this, yeah, I get to do this special, but I, I find myself getting to where I don't really like making those choices. I don't know what it is about it. I just don't. This is one of those games where, and I haven't even played, I've only played with the base ones. I even have the special edition that comes with a ton of different ones. I find I don't mind this one that much, but I also think it's because while they're good and strong, I feel like it also matters on what you're trying to do for that turn as to whether you're taking those, where it's not just all about those. So I think this just incorporated a little bit better. When I first played this, someone taught it to me. I bought it because it was like, oh yeah, it's a Western. I like Westerns. I didn't really like the way the game looked. And I heard it had that pick a character. And that's the character you have to use at the moment. And I was like, oh, I don't know. But then instantly, as soon as I played it, I knew I liked this game. And then the more I played it, the more I tend to like the game. And it kind of just stays exactly where it's at. I mean, 39 this year, 33 the year before. And then the year before that, it wasn't 50, but I think that was because, like I said, I think that was the first year I played it, so I was playing it a little bit, and then we saw it move up a little bit, and now it's it's about where it's at. I, said, I know we already talked about Western Legends, so this one being a Western, I think this one's just different, because this one's more of a point salad Western, which that one is too in Western Legends, but this one, you're not really able to just do everything you can in Western Legends, but this one, it just it catches the land grab a little bit more, and... I find it interesting the way the worker placement works because you can duel over certain spots if you want them. And then just because of how you worker place on when you get to pull off the stuff you want to pull off, I just end up liking this game a lot. Uh, 
way more than I expected to like it when looking at it from the outside. But playing it every time, I've enjoyed it. Like I said, I just I keep wanting to play it more. So, hence the reasons in my top 100 and up in my top half. So, that'd be Carson City, number 39. My number 38 is Res Arcana. This is a great game. I, I guess I kind of understand why people compare it to Magic. Just because of the way certain cards are tapped or exhausted in that game. And because of the theme. But really... I feel like this one is just, other than because you turn cards to the side and the theme is you're getting these mana or elements that you're using to buy your cards, I get that that is a good comparison to Magic. And this is a great game to be able to maybe show to a Magic player and see if they are interested in trying out other games. But other than that, I think it just doesn't really have other similarities are two magic in that regards. Now, while this is in my top half, I will say a lot of the new is shine. Uh, the new shine, I should say, is falling off of this game a little bit for me. I don't really know how to what to call it. I always call it the Dominion problem. For if you've ever played Dominion, the deck building game, where, and I know it sounds weird as I say it, it feels like if you played this game, the more you played this game. And the more combinations you've seen, just the more of an, a huge advantage. I'm not saying, I mean, that's with any game. Any game you play more, you're going to have an advantage over people. But this one just feels such a high one. And, and even if it's not just an advantage, it's really, it's one of those games where it's, all I got to do is find the most busted combo faster than you find the most busted combo. And that's the reason I call it the Dominion problem, because in Dominion, if you know, oh, this combos with this and this and those happen to come out now i just go into those combos and i'm just doing well this one really feels like like this one moves down a little bit is, is moving down a little bit for me not a lot i mean it was 31 the year before and 20 ish the year before that so i mean it is moving down not dropping but just moving down a little bit because every time i play it while it's fast it's easy i do love all that about it it just really is really disheartening when you sit there and you're like all right this is what i got to work with and go and then you look over and someone's just destroyed you <laughs> it's like oh well i had a combo but you're about to end the game and my combo's not even close to going off so but other than that it's a great game and that's not talking about it in a bad way when i say that because it is still just a fun game to play I think that's just what's starting to affect me a little bit on it. Like when people go, hey, let's play Res Arcana. And I'm like, eh. Now I will say, and it does make it even more random when I say that, I really don't like drafting this game. Uh, I, I prefer just deal me out some stuff. And because of how fast those combos can just go off, I'd rather just deal me cards and I deal with them as I go. I feel like if I waste the time to draft and just get blown away in that combo... I just wasted time drafting and I'd rather just you deal me out cards and I just go. So, so I just rather deal it out random and just go just to make the game faster and just to also maybe get it on the table again. Because I felt every time when I drafted this game after the draft, I don't know if it was just because of the length of time, but I really didn't care to play again. I was like, let's go on to, on to another game. Whereas usually if I just deal it out and we go, I'm cool with just shuffling up and dealing again. I feel like it just goes so much faster and and see what it can go from that, you know. But just the selections you can make in this game is why it stays up there. I also like a lot of the selections you can make in the game as far as finding things and trying to time at the right time when to get the victory points. Ten points, real. it seems like, man, when you're sitting there trying to get them, man, one point at a time until all of a sudden you're able to get like four or five points on one turn. And you're like, okay, yeah, that was cool. So... Nice game if you want to try it out. Really easy. Definitely one that the second I played it, I knew it would be in my top 100 games just because of the play style and the way I felt it went with. So, my number 38, Res Arcana. My number 37 is actually a game that I wanted for so long. It was so hard to find. Now you're going to be able to find it more readily available as it's starting to hit retail stores and whatnot. But that game is Dwellings of Eldervale. This was a game that the second I saw the mechanics and the second I heard 
Mike Delisio and Dice Tower talking about it and the way they talked about the things you could do in the game. All that was just a combination. I even was waiting six months at a time, waiting on it to go back in stock and trying to get it. And then it was kind of funny because I was able to finally get it on my birthday as far as I like, get it ordered. And once it came in, I played it. I knew instantly this was a game I just enjoyed all the way the meshing of the mechanics were, the variance of things you could do. The way the worker placement worked, it's even got area control, it just mixes so much stuff in there that I thought was really cool. And I even had to go and get the extra version where it has the little bases that make the monster noises just because I wanted the extra rrrr. And we can't help ourselves that when we're playing the game we have it out, we have to hit the table just so we can hear all the monsters roar and stuff like that. And even when I put the monsters out, I gotta make sure they make their noises and stuff. So I mean... This is a great game to try out. It was hard to find. It is a little pricey. So I would say try it out first before you make the expense and look into it. And then now they even have the so-called sequel of it coming out. Or really, just a, not really a sequel or implementation, but the game's similar to it. Andromeda's Edge. And I can't wait for that one because space theme, you know, this one's a fantasy theme. I'm really more into the fantasy theme. I am curious to see what they do with the space theme. Dwellings of Eldervale has already been kind of a big deal just to see if, what else they could incorporate with it. I will admit, last year it was a much higher. It was in my, it was number 15. It has come down for me a little bit, but I kind of figured it would. While there is so much that can happen in the game and so many different things that could happen that change the way you play, it did start feeling a little samey to me. That's not saying it in a bad way, it's just it, it didn't really feel like each game played out different for me. Other than what my faction did, but even then, it felt like I just do the same stuff I was doing with another faction, just doing it with different meeples. And maybe slightly in a different way. So to me, it just started feeling the same way, but since I love the mechanics of the game and a lot of the things that the game did, it didn't really drop that much. It still stayed in my top, you know, 40. And we'll see if it stays there. I think it will, because I do like playing the game. It is a table hog, and I will say if you're a solo player, this does have a really good solo that does work really well. And I love the way you can get certain cards, and the way those cards can come out because of the different elements that are in play at the time, and the different combos you can pull off with each of those elements, is an amazing thing about this game. So if you get a chance to play it, go try it out, Dwellings of Eldervell. My number 36 is Castles of Burgundy. This is another one of those games. The second I played it, I knew I instantly liked it. So I did just sell my copy of it only because I have the Awakened Realms one coming in with all the miniatures and stuff. Do I need the miniatures? No. Do I want the miniatures? Yes. But this one, I did have the Aaliyah Anniversary Edition one where it had all the more beautiful art, hard to read tiles, but all the beautiful art and whatnot. And this one was one that it just, I mean, it has dice rolling. I like that. And just the way you can choose how to use your dice, uh, I feel fits the mitigation. And it has mitigation also if you have workers that you can use to up and lower your numbers. But also just having choices of what to do with your numbers. Because you can use the numbers to either place tiles down on your board or you can use those numbers to grab other tiles off the board or to grab other trade resources, I think they're called. They're just like little square things that you can go turn in for money, which you can use to get some mitigation. So many different things you can do with this game. Like I said, the second I played it, knew it was going to be in my top 100. Uh, just enjoyed it that much. This is one of those ones that does have a ton of promos, just kind of like Rogers of the Ganges, where... There are so many different little things, but each of them are kind of cool in their own way if you can add them in, like different boards, or I want to say there's one that, I forgot what they call them, but it's kind of like a trade route where you can use those resources instead of trading them in to actually do things to get more victory points. There's a reason why this game was in the top 20 players choice each year, and then now it's back. It's a good game. This is... One, even when I sold my copy to one of my usuals, he came back and was like, yeah, that was a good game. And why don't we play that more? And I was like, well, we could, except I sold you my copy and now I'm waiting on the Awakened Realms one. So if you haven't checked out Castle of Burgundy, this is a great one to check out. 
and see what it's about and you'll see it it, it it has a little bit of everything for each type of player. If you're the min-maxer, you're going to find something in there you like. If you like dice rolling, you're going to find something in there. And go check it out. Castles of Burgundy, my number 36. My number 35 isn't so much a game as it is a compilation of several games put together. It is also probably my second, I, I can almost say for a fact, it is my second most played game if we're talking about it as all as one. And I am one of those people who plays with it all as one. We call it DC Deck Builder, but my DC Deck Builder's pretty much got everything in it. And I've played it so much with people in College Station and people here that where we have mixed everything in there. And I'm talking Street Fighter, the Cartoon Network stuff. And now it doesn't get as much play because I, I, I want to play with the Rebirth stuff where it has the movement, which also allows us to mix the Attack on Titan stuff in. And I think a lot of my guys that like playing it, I, I, get, I get what they liked about it. They, they really like just the simplicity of it being a deck builder and we're just going to this. And then now... It seems like adding all that in just added a lot more complexity and grindiness, which I get it. I, I do understand that. And it's just the person in me wanting to see if there's a way we can play with everything again. And the reason I say it's these games can be mixed, if you look at the back of the box of a Cryptozoic game, it's going to say the Cerberus Engine heroes or whatnot. And that lets you know you can mix these things in. Where they're real bad about is they don't really let you know how to mix these in very well. Or where they, they, I love how they release some things in the game that say, oh, just play with some of the decks or just play with this. But then on the side of the box for advertising, they're like, play ultimate where you mix everything. Well, you, you didn't tell me how to do that. You told me to play that way, but you don't tell me how to do that. Um, we do. And then we end up playing with a lot of house rules, which is funny because when I looked online, there's a lot of the house rules that we just came up with as we were playing it and trying to figure out how to make certain things work and other people just did the same thing or something similar or even something similar to where enough to where it's like, oh, I do like the way the little bit. I thought that was cool what we did, but what they did is just a little bit extra of a take. So then I'll switch it up a little bit and play with their uh, rules. But I, I've had to have played this game probably... I want to say last I checked seven, eight hundred times. And that's from the get-go, playing it with just... And I hated this from the get-go. I thought Vanilla was so bad, such a bad... In, in, in comparison to all the other deck-building games that I was playing at the time, like Legendary, Dominion, Thunderstone, I really hated DC deck-builder, just straight Vanilla, the, just the box. And then I want to say we got Street Fighter in, and I had no interest in it because... I didn't like the original. And they, even though people were like, oh, you can mix that in. I was like, nah, I'm good. I want to say they came out with the one that had Shazam in it is the next time when I really looked at it. And I bought it. I kind of liked it a little bit more, but not enough to make me go, huh. But when they said you can mix it, and then I remember we had the Street Fighter at the shop and I had the vanilla at the house. I was like, let me buy the Street Fighter. Let's mix all this in. Let's see what it does. And I liked it mixed. I liked everything in there. I liked what the Street Fighter incorporated in. As a matter of fact, as much as people sit there and say you cannot mix the Street Fighter in, well, if you go mix in Arrow, which is one of the small expansions you can mix in from DC Deck Builder, it literally incorporates a mechanic that is used in the Street Fighter to a degree. So that means those are two mechanics that now they're mixed in together make it better. So... I, I like playing this game a lot for mixing everything in. I'm going to give it a little bit more go with the Rebirth stuff. See if we can keep it in there. But yeah, I kind of agree with everyone. I liked it better when we were just able to just bust it out. Bust out 120 random cards from, random, from the random deck. Have another lineup that always pulls from the box. And just all the little house rules we played with. And I even posted a lot of the house rules up on BGG and the forums that show some of the stuff we played with to be able to mix all of it in. And we enjoy it. And I understand why people so don't like, don't enjoy it to some degree because it is a pretty vicious game. It has a lot of attacks, but it also has a lot of defense cards and whatnot. So 
If you're into just the old school style deck building games, you want something that doesn't that is steeped in theme, this one is not. This is just that's the reason it can incorporate all these other licenses and stuff like that into it, because it's just a slapped on skin that could have been put on anything. But to me, us playing like we play with where you get a hero and you get a psychic, so you're getting two characters that you get to use the abilities from both of them. So then that way if the deck is hinging, oh, I chose Batman, but there's not a lot of equipment coming out. Well, I have my other character I can hinge upon and work with their ability upon and whatnot. Just the way you can just do all that and find these weird combos and these awesome things that you can just pull off. I just, I like this game. I thought it was, I did like it when it was simpler. I get Everything, I can go back and harp on it. I do want to pull everything out, but I'm also seeing that there isn't a way we can incorporate everything and still have the game that we enjoyed playing. Doesn't look like it's going to work, but we'll keep trying little things. But every so often, when they come out with a new standalone expansion, that gives us our chance to just play that standalone expansion and just play that and then incorporate it into everything and see what's up. But DC deck building game or the Cerberus engine is my number 35. And, that, and it's been... But they're pretty steady, 35, 28 before, 26 before that. So it's just kind of staying in the same number range there. And I think it's just mostly because of that engine right there. Just the fun. And a lot of this is just like with Axis and Allies. A lot of this is that sentimentality of me and my friends having so much fun with this game. Just having so much fun. And the point of playing the game is to have fun. So that's my number 35, DC deck building game or the Cerberus engine. My number 34 dropped quite a bit, and I think I know why. It is a game that catches so much heck at our shop from a couple of our players that just, just because of the simplicity of the game, they want nothing to do with it, and that is Ecos. I get it. It's just bingo, but I mean, if you look at any game, there's some game at its base that it's just based around. I don't look at this as just bingo, because I don't remember the last time when I played bingo and I got a bunch of victory points or I built out a world... I'm pretty sure if I show up to a bingo hall with my Ecos cards and try to scream out Ecos as I'm doing stuff, yeah, they're going to throw me out or, or tell me that I'm stupid. I know why it dropped. And I think a lot of it is because of that. I think not getting it to the table to enjoy with the group. I want, to, I want everybody at our table to enjoy the games that they're playing. So if everyone else is enjoying it, I'm not going to throw a game on the table that everyone else is not going to enjoy. And if that game is too simple for a couple of my players... To where they don't want to play it. Well I'm not going to put it on the table then. But I do enjoy this game. I love seeing what type of continent we're able to build. And what animals we're able to get. And for the most part. When I put this game on the table. Especially when we have new players at the shop. I don't know any of the new players who don't like this game. They enjoy it. They love seeing what combos they can pull off. Something about when they can bring that shark out. And eat that whole school of fish. Or when they can sit there and destroy a spot as they're trying to put water and more water on the continent. But then other people keep refilling that spot in so that they can keep a savanna live and ready. I, I find this game very enjoyable. And sometimes I just feel like you want a game that's... It doesn't have to be crunchy. I don't have to sit there and be grinding my brain gears constantly and something about this game just sits well with me to where i love it because it was number 13 literally 13 two years in a row it was 34 this year 13 two years in a row i have fun playing with the group of people over playing a solo game if people aren't having fun with the game that's going to add make it to where i'm not having fun with the game either so i think that's the only reason it dropped a little bit or it may be pub people put it in the right spot and i was just rating it too high when i was doing everything else we'll see what it does next year I do feel like you do need to play to 80 points. The 60 points seems like, yeah, if you play to 60 points, it is a faster game. 60 points, you can get to that in no time. So sometimes your combo might not even be maybe building up what you're trying to do. Or the continent, you need the continent to be bigger. And by the time someone hits 60, the continent's just, not, just now right for you to start scoring. And then now, game's over. I do feel like it needs to be played at 80 if you want to try something simple and you like this little weird world building and you like AEG games, this is a good one to check out. Ecos. My number 33, this is another one's ones where I lump in several iterations of this game into one game. And this one has been 
in my top 100, I can 100% guarantee has been in my top 100 since before I was making top 100s. Because when people were flipping their lid and talking all the amazing talk about Catan, which at that time I was really into Catan too, this was my game. This was the one when I was like, man, you're saying Catan is like the best board game. This to me is the best board game I've ever played. And that is Arkham Horror. The iteration that I consider the top iteration I'll play is Eldritch Horror. So back then I was playing Arkham Horror 2nd Edition and just the diversity in the game and how much each character that you were playing had a completely different player power that you could use. And depending on that player power is how you are able to handle and do things like closing the portals or defeating monsters or getting money so that you could help other people be able to close portals or defeat monsters. I mean, every time they released an expansion of this, I love this game even more. When they came out with Eldritch Horror, it fixed so many issues I had with this game, which I say so many. There were only a few issues I had. And even then, they weren't issues where I just didn't want to play the game no more. But it was just... They streamlined and cleaned up so much stuff. Now, they made the game way longer, but they also, like, one of the main things they cleaned up with Elder Horror is, if you played Arkham Horror and or Elder Horror, you know you're talking a 30-minute setup. This is one of those games I joke about all the time, where it's like, man, if I set this up, we're playing it at least twice, because this takes so long to set up. That we need to, if, if, we, if, if, we, if we lose quickly, we're playing it again. Now, if we have a good game, I get it. But in Arkham, you could literally lose turn two or three. I've had it happen. It was just, stuff just goes wrong real bad, real fast. Not saying that can't happen in Eldritch Horror, but Eldritch Horror, by changing the goals of the game and changing randomly what you need to pull off, just that little thing made the game very much feel different and unique each game to where each game didn't just feel like I'm going to head down to the roadhouse, try to pick up a bunch of allies, or I'm going to head off to the cemetery, which I know eventually I could hit the thing that gives me the ally bodyguard that I just kind of want because he's over there for some reason. Small things that Arkham Horror did well, you know, because it was doing things that games hadn't weren't doing at that time, I felt. Eldritch Horror just streamlined a lot of that and cleaned a lot of that up and made it to where I couldn't just go, this is how this game's played because these are the characters we have. Another thing that Eldritch Horror cleaned up was a problem I have with the monsters, but of course also it's because if you play Arkham, you're just in a town environment and you're just having to move around in that town, which means, yes, if there's a monster on the streets, you just can't get around that monster without having to evade it or something like that. And Eldritch, it's a world base, so a monster could be in the same town as you, but you can still just pull off things in that town. But the more the monsters are out there, the harder the game is. Now, I will say the movement around the board in Eldritch is so complicated. Uh, not really complicated, just such an overbearsome thing. But this is one I enjoy this game, even though it's four hours and there is so much downtime. This would be, just like I say, Western Legends is if you like Westerns and you want that Western feel. This is if you like Arkham Horror and you want to be steeped in that Arkham Horror feel and that storytelling, this can do it. This, this, this is going to be that. But as I say that, the reason I compare this to Western Legends is this is that game that you need to be ready just to sit around. Y'all are just going to be chilling ready for a long game, but you're just going to be having fun, kicking back some adult beverages, and just enjoying the Cthulhu theme and trying to pull off the goals to win. It is a co-op, so that's the reason I put that higher because it's not so much being rude or mean to each other to get that feel. And you need, you need to work together in this. It is a very hard game. If you if you are if you have someone just trying to be a lone wolf and doing everything on their own, they you can't let them do that. But then you got to make sure you're going to take care of the other stuff that they're not taking care of. This is one 
every Halloween, we always do our stay up until dawn, playing board games and magic until dawn, surviving till dawn. We do this every Halloween. This is a game that I always make sure to have uh, one of our local gamers, Shannon Choi, bring his copy of. And we play this game and have a great time playing it. And seeing our guys either go insane or go or get knocked out and getting our new characters and seeing if we can still win. If you want to join us for this one, we'll be open doing it again on this one. I guarantee it. This is the one I advertise that we will be playing on that day for sure. It's always a great time to be had. Like I said, and now I know they came out with a third edition, which my only issue with the third edition of Arkham Horror is, because it, it takes everything that I like that they did with Eldritch Horror and moved it over to third edition Arkham Horror and brings it back to the game that I remember and love so much. But third edition, but it just added too much fiddliness to it. Enough so that really what I was really looking forward to for Arkham Horror third edition was something I had seen in another one of their Arkham Files games, Mansions of Madness. They had an app. I really wish Arkham just had an app or availability to an app. And I get it. People lost their crap online about when they, when that they were worried people were going to put an app, that uh, Fantasy Flight was going to make an app for this and make it an app based just like Mansions of Madness. I was actually one of the few who was, hey, Let's do it. If, you, if I can load up the app and it can have the cards on there and I don't have to take 45 minutes to set up the game, I can just set it up as fast as Mansion of Madness can and I can get engrossed and just put into that game environment and not have to do all that big setup and not have to worry about the filliness of, oh, I got to take two of these cards and make sure one goes on top or shuffle these. And... There's too, way too much fiddly stuff going on in 3rd edition. There should have been an app. I... I disagree with the other people online. This should have had an app. And I think I would have liked 3rd Edition more. Other than that, because of that, because of the fiddliness, I just go back and play Elder Tor. Elder Tor is my Arkham Horror. I haven't checked for a while. Maybe somebody made an app now. And hopefully they did. And that'll make me go back. I still play Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. I own everything to it. But I would just rather play Elder Tor. I just don't want to mess with that fiddliness. I don't want to be three turns into the game and be like, oh... We did this wrong, guys. And that takes you out of the game when you got to stop, pull yourself out of the immersion to make sure you're doing all this Philly stuff right just so you can enjoy the game. I don't like that. I'm sorry. Uh, this needs an app real bad. But that's enough bashing on 3rd Edition, Elder Tour, sticking in there still, staying in my top half, which I knew it would because I loved Arkham Horror so much. So Elder Tour slash Arkham Horror, my number 33, like I said, it was... 27 the year before that, 29 the year before that. It was 62 the year before that. I think that's because at that time I used to consider Arkham and Eldritch two separate games. But to me, they're just too similar. And I consider these the same game. And once I considered that, you can see they stayed pretty steady. steady. 33, 27, 29. And that's whether I play Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, or Eldritch. I, I, I'm going to consider those all the same. And this is where it should stay, it looks like. On my list, in my top. My number 32, new to the list, and just knew it would be. I've already talked about these games for a while. Garfield games. I love the Garfield games. I, I, I'm not as hot on this one as others are. I do like it, though. Hence, it's number, my number 32. But we have Wayfarers of the South Tigris. Don't like this game as much as everyone else. I do love a lot of what this game does. But this is a take on the dice placement mechanic the building out of the tableau i love that in this game there's a lot of things i love in this game the first playthrough of this game is a beast and it's not so much because it's so hard it's because it's so different from other games that it makes it hard to figure out what direction you should go so i always just tell people just do something just do whatever your dice are telling you to do you're going to find a direction. And just the way you can do so many things and, oh, well, you block me out of this. That means I can just go over and do this with my dice. Or I can incorporate something over here that's going to give me money, which is going to allow me to do this. And this is also the first in a trilogy he's about to do. The second one finished off Kickstarter about a month or so back. 
I think Scholars of the South Tigris, which when he does these trilogies, which also means he's going to probably do a box that's going to combine them all together, and we'll see how it does it. I love the way the map plays out, whether you're buying islands, or we say buying islands, but you're getting islands because you're exploring the islands, or if you're exploring the ground, or if you're exploring the sky, which you have to have the ground in order to explore the sky, or just the islands and the water in order to explore the sky. Just all the different routes and ways you can go about getting victory points and the way things combo in this game. So different. So cool. This is why Garfield Games, I can, as a retailer, just get a copy of the game cheap. But I'm going to Kickstarter them every time because I want to back them every time. And I always speak so highly of Garfield Games. Ever since Raiders of the North Sea, I have not hit a Garfield game yet that I do not like. I love them. I, I, I was trying to think of something clever to say, and I can't. I love these Garfield games so far. So until I get burned with a bad game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy their games. Not much else I can say. Just realize if you only played this once, that was a, that, that, and, you, and you just didn't like the game, play it again. That first playthrough is really a rough beast. Especially if you've already played the Garfield games. One of the simplicity about the Garfield games is they use a lot of the same symbols. This one incorporated a ton of new ones. So while it had some symbols that were the same, it had a lot that weren't. And so it did. It, one of the easy things about Garfield games are usually when you play a new one, a lot of the same symbols you recognize so you just got to learn a few of the new ones um, this one had a lot you had to learn but just the way everything just combos and syncs together when everything's going like when you once you figure out how to do things very clean very fun i could go off on this forever i know this is probably long enough so i'm just going to stop talking about it now so we can move on but wayfarers of south tigris number 32 my number 31 Another one of those games I got from Fantasy Flight years ago, and it was my game that when people wanted to play a fantasy adventure game, kind of in the vein, like I said, of an open world, go do what you want to do type game, this was it. And I, I want to say the first edition, upgrade to the second edition. I even enjoyed the third edition, even though the third edition set me on tilt once. But the second edition is what I'm talking about here. And my number 31 is Runebound. And even this one, since I had it for a while, played it. It was 31 this year, 18 last year. But like I said, I think that was a, because it was 30, 40 years before that. So I think that was a fluke, like an outlier, even with the way I did the system. This seems about where it should be at. This is my, you want to sit back and just relax and have fun. Go sandbox fantasy. You want to go fight dragon type things. Or if you want to go fight a bear. Or you want to, just what you can run into in the open world as you're trying to get the victory points and whatever you're trying to go, because there were so many different expansions of changing the end game conditions. This is that game. This is the fantasy one. This is the one I love playing so much. Now, because it was so old, it kind of had a PVP thing. I didn't really like so much. I felt the PVP was too harsh because you get knocked out. They get to, if someone PVPs you, they get to take anyone, anything they want from you, one item or all your money or whatever. And then even on top of that, you have to lose half your items and half your money. And oh my goodness, it felt like if somebody just wanted to go over there and wallop you and make the game miserable for you, like you can in Western Legends, because someone could do that to you. I feel like this one did it. And this is that one that, if you want to, like, like I incorporate with Arkham Horror, if you want to play a Western adventure game, Sandbox, you go play Western Legends. You want to play goth or a horror, go around the world fighting monsters, exploring that Elder God horror Sandbox, you're going to go Arkham Horror. This is the fantasy, same thing. And even then, I was, <laughs> I was actually really nervous bringing it out last year to uh, show it to my group and see if they would enjoy it. But we brought it out one night when we were like, man, it's an hour and a half before close. We're probably not going to finish this game. But the nice thing is, we're just going to play and have fun, and we'll just stop whenever we're ready to go home. And when that hour and a half hit, 
nobody wanted to go home. Everybody was like, man, if you're willing to stay, we're having fun. We want to play this game. All the fun and sentimental stuff I enjoy from the second edition, I still enjoy. I bring it out and we decide. We're going, I, I mix in some of the decks. We see what we're going to do. Right now, I have everything mixed. It's just the end goals. Um, you know, it, if you played Runebound and you have all the expansions, you know all the different stuff that can happen and things you can do. So this is that sandbox fantasy game. This is the one I would choose if I was... I can't think of any other one that if I was choosing a sandbox fantasy adventure game, this is the one I choose to play. It's Runebound. And I'm going to put it on the table when we want to play that. We're just going to play until we don't want to play anymore or somebody wins. My number 30 is a game that I'm in the minority of that I like more than another game. So, spoiler, the other game will not be up on my list. This is the ver this is the one I like. This is Imperial Settlers. I know I agree Imperial Settlers North uh, Empires of the North Sea is a cleaner, more streamlined game and each faction does feel uniquely different play when you play it. But Imperial Settlers, along with 51st State, because it uses the same mechanics, this is the version I enjoy. Now, I will say, only thing that held this up here, because it was moving down for me, because I am one of those people, I do not have people build a deck before they play. So if you're playing this game, you're playing with all the cards from the Egyptians, or you're playing all the cards from Romans. And if you're playing... Some of the factions don't have all the cards or don't have a big, fat, thick deck. You're probably going to have an advantage. But I'm not playing this just to win. I'm playing this to have fun. And I love, just like I did with 51st State, I love the way the, the building out your tableau works. I like how simple the production is, how you can do some features, how you can do some combos. I get it with playing with everything in the deck. There are times when you're going to just it's going to be bloated. The deck's going to be bloated. Let's be real. I also feel like some of those factions, like the Egyptians and stuff, that without that bloat, feel like they're going to be... Like, if, if I trim that Egyptian deck down and get to build it the way I want, I feel like I can just do some crazy combos, especially with gold. This is one I really enjoy. I This is my portal game. When I think of portal games, I always think of this game. Now... Like I said, I don't think it would be this high. I think it would have moved down because of how much bloat I have on this game. I've almost played this game like 80, 90 times. When they mixed in that last expansion where you get to see if your nation continues to go on and you get stuff in between games or how you do well in those games gets you more stuff. I love that. So even if I'm losing the game, as long as I... Make sure my nation is continuing to go and I get to add stuff. I'm having fun to see how far my nation can go and what I can pull off and what I can do with my nation. I love that. I think it's called Rise of Empires. Or Rise of the Empire or something like that. I love that expansion. I Oh man, if they mixed something like that into Empires of the North, that could pop it up. There was, and I know we're not talking about Empires of the North... There was something similar, because people are going to go, well, they did. There was, um, I think it was called, yeah, Wrath of, sorry, it's right over here. It was called Wrath of the Lighthouse. They did try to incorporate, but there was a solo only, and they tried to incorporate something that did. I thought, man, when I read and opened Wrath of the Lighthouse, I was like, mm, that's going to move it in my top 100. Oh my God, I hope they come out with some Wrath. And I haven't checked. Maybe they have since I played it. I literally stopped playing... I want to say four or five scenarios in because I was so tired of finding out I was either doing something wrong or in the last scenario I played in there, there was literally a thing that I realized you can't pull off. And then when I went and looked online, everyone else was like, yeah, you can't do this. This, this is not, this doesn't say how to do this. And they had to come out and say, oh, you just do this. We, it, it's a misprint. It means to go. I don't remember if they said it was a misprint or it's just, but it was like, you have to do this. This is what it means to do. To do. Okay. Every scenario had that problem. Until then, Imperial Seller is going to be that game I like. Now, to be fair, this was the first one I played. I have customers who don't play board games, who were just Magic players, who sat down and played Imperial Sellers with me. And they still talk about how 
good of a game this is and how much they enjoyed it, even with the bloat. Because they couldn't see the bloat because they didn't know the difference <laughs> since we're all playing with the bloat. But I love this game, and it's probably going to stay here. I'll be surprised if it falls out of... I, I would be immensely surprised if it fell out of my top 100 because I, every time I play this game, I enjoy it, even whether I'm winning or losing, especially because of that Rise of the Empire. That, that was like a saving grace of... All right, it might have dropped if it wasn't for that. Now it's staying pretty high for me. I love that. I love this game. I need to stop. I'm probably going to edit out a lot of that, but Imperial Settlers, number 30. My number 29, no surprise. I knew it'd be higher up on the list. Just didn't know how high. And actually, this is one that moved up a lot for me. Not just from last year, but actually from the year. It moved up a lot the year before, but it's because of the expansions. This is another Garfield game. This is the one a lot of people do enjoy more. Um, I do like this game. This is one that probably hits the table more, about as much as Raiders of the North Sea hits the table, if not more. And it's only because of how many players it can incorporate. But that is Architects of the West Kingdom. This one, because of the player count and the simplicity of the game, is one I can bust out. If we have a lot of players that and we don't want to split up into, a, they just don't want to split up into a group, and they just want to like they'll have time, they'll be like, "Yeah, let's split up into groups." Or can we play architects or something? I'll throw architects out because it can incorporate a bunch of players. And if you haven't played architects, this is another where they take another take on worker placement differences. Whereas raiders, you only get one worker at all times, and you're always swapping that in for another worker. This one gives you. 20 workers you're starting with you're going to just place one worker at a time and when you place you're going to get whatever you place at i placed here i got stone next turn i place there i get two stone because i have another worker there next turn i place there i get three stone because i have two other workers there the simplicity of it and this was lower on my list like i said two years ago because it was 29 this year, 35 last year, so about the same. 78 the year before that. And it's the expansion. The expansion moved this up for me. Because before that, I felt the game, I just felt it was a little too short, or I didn't see the diff I didn't see the reason to build buildings. Uh, I always just raced up the cathedral, and it felt like whoever raced up the cathedral won the game. And you'd bring out a few buildings. With that first expansion where they made it to where you can put an adornment on your building or you can get tools for your i want to say apprentices um i always get those terms mixed up in all these games but your little helper cards that moved this game up a lot for me i just love the way this game works works very simply with a bunch of people more people even makes it to where you could do like some of the spots just become more desirable because you can round up certain people and you're not just picking on others. I will warn, do not play this game two-player. I think every time I've tried playing this game two-player, it was a miserable experience. It, it was a good solo game. And I do want to play this game with the Tome Saga, which if you saw my thing I talked about with the runes, with the Raiders of the North Sea, where they use a, a rune saga to incorporate the whole tr North Sea trilogy into one campaign. So it's one game, three games into one game. Tome Saga is another one on my list. I want to be able to play through the West Kingdom with the Tome Saga, which would be Architects into Paladins of the West Kingdom into Viscounts of the West Kingdom. There's, there's so much I can say about this game that it would just take forever. Architects of the West Kingdom, Garfield Games. I've said it all already. Number 29. My number 28, this is my Uwe Rosenberg game. This is the one I love the most. And it's funny because it's 28 this year. Last year it was 20. year before that it was 41. It was in the 40s because it was 36, 40. So it was in that 36, 40 range. I know what made it move up to 20, and I know why it's still at 28. That's not saying a bad thing. This is Feast for Odin. It's so silly to say, and I can't wait. I heard there's another expansion coming out. I haven't even seen all the cards. I haven't even mixed in one of the decks from the original box. I love playing this game. 
it, it, it always scares people off when you tell them there's like going to be 60 plus spots that you could work or place at. But I always tell people, while there's that many places to work or place at, about, I'd say, 20-30% of those, about a quarter of the way in the game, you're never even going to look at them because you're never going to use those spots because it's not what you're working on anyways. This is my game. I, As far as Uwe Rosenberg, if this is, I had to pick one for Uwe Rosenberg. This is the one I know. I can't think of one that's higher. We'll see, but I don't. I cannot think of one. I love this one. I love how I can go the cards route, and that steers me a certain direction, or I can go breed livestock, and I know what made it move up to 20 from the 40s into the 20s. And it's so silly to say, but it was a, one of the many expansions. And by many, I'm not saying many. I know my accent. I'm saying many, like small expansions. And it was one that gives you, it's like this little square, but it gives you something unique for you. That on harvest times, you're going to get this one. On non-harvest times, you're going to flip it over and you're going to get this. Just that little thing that you get something different that someone else does it. That had nothing to do with cards. That had nothing to do with anything else. It's just that little thing. I don't know why. I think it's just that thing about player powers in my brain that I love. That little thing alone popped this into my 20s. I enjoy playing this game every chance I get. Now, as I say that, I'm not really a big fan of that polyomino thing that it does in this game. I like the polyomino games. I'm not a fan of that in this game. But I'm also not deterred from it. I just look at it as part of the game and finding a way to do stuff to cover that stuff up. It does not get to the table as much as I would like it to just because of I know it can scare people off or it's just not other people's cup of tea. But this is my Uwe Rosenberg game. And once again, just like I'm sure there's going to be everything else that's been this list. There, I could go off on all types of things about this game. Other than just saying it's my number 28. Number one Uwe Rosenberg game. Feast for Odin. My number 27 is another one of those sandbox games. This is just the sandbox if you want to play Pirates. I feel like this game captures that. Pirates or merchants, uh, but just catches captures that Caribbean sailing a boat sandbox feel. That game is Merchants and Marauders. I fell in love with this game instantly. As I say that, I hate the way this game ends. I really hate the way the glory system works. The combat is so unique. <laughs> it is very unique. But the combat system is so different and unique, but it's also just so hard, so hard to teach. But I love everything in this game. This is my sandbox pirate game. You want to be a merchant? You, you can be a merchant. You can go the slow and steady. You will do well eventually just delivering things. Or you could press your luck, be a pirate, Possibly win, but a lot faster before the merchant wins, but you're going to have to press your luck and hopefully take one of those big ships out with your dinghy or sloop. If you want a sandbox pirate game, this is it. Merchants and Marauders to me, this is where I feel like I can look at my character, see if I feel like they're doing well as a merchant, or if I feel like being a merchant, or if I feel like they should be a pirate, or... I can choose if they have a merchant ability. Maybe I'm just going to dabble a little bit in it. Dabble a little bit in pirate while delivering some merchant supplies. Once again, just like comparing Arkham Horror, Elder Gods, Western Legends, Western, Runebound Fantasy, Merchants and Marauders, Pirates. My number 27, Merchants and Marauders. Surprise, surprise. My number 26, last one we're going to talk about today. Garfield Games, West Kingdom game. I am in the minority on how much I like this game. Viscounts of the West Kingdom. It was 21 last year, which is the first year I played it. Came onto the list into the 20s, staying about where it's at. I love this game, even when I'm having a terrible game of it. I love playing this game. I watched a playthrough with Shim Phillips and knew instantly that I would love this game. 
I was waiting with anticipation for this game because I knew it had everything I liked. It had deck building. It had a way to use the deck build the cards without having to put them in my deck. So I could just, man, I really like that card, but it's not good enough to be in my deck. Well, I can just use it. I like the way I can choose what I want to go do. Do I want to build buildings and get victory points? Or do I want to do area control in the middle and try to get victory points that way? Do I want to write manuscripts and get victory points that way, which is going to give me sets, so I'm set collecting, basically. There are so many different ways to go in this. And I love trying to figure it out every time. I love seeing what character I get because that's going to kind of push me in a direction I should go. I get it. It's just deck building in slow motion. Instead of playing out your whole hands from your deck, you're playing one card at a time. But the cool thing about that is that one card is going to stick there for three turns. Or you could build some type of combo where if that card's really good... Well, find a way to get it on your board and then find a way to get your board refreshed so that it comes off the board so it's it back in your discard pile so that you can hopefully get it shuffled back in. I love everything about this game. I think it catches a lot of hate because it just doesn't live up to what people enjoyed so much about Architects. But since I love deck building, this, this was, like I said, I knew it was going to be my game. I, I knew I'd love it. Just the ability to be able to go whatever direction I need to go. I don't know what else I can say about the game. I love it. Uh, I wish I could play it more. I do get to, I do have to play it a lot solo. I have a few people who will play it with me, but typically when I do play this game, I do have to play it solo. I do love what the expansions added. Now, I do argue that they didn't need two expansions. Both those expansions could have been just in one box. That could have just been one expansion, but that's neither here nor there. I liked what both of them incorporated. They just gave ways to mitigate your cards a little bit more or to focus you in one direction. It also, the ability to give you, I already said I love the ability of getting that one, find out what that character I got dealt at the beginning of the game is, what they do, and making sure to use that character to the best of my ability. The expansion allows me to get more of those characters. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. Love Garfield games. Everything I've already said about Garfield games. Number 26, Viscounts of the West Kingdom. And hopefully that wasn't too long. But with that, we're going to stop for the day. The next ones may be a little while before I get the next ones out, depending on scheduling. If not, I might just bust out my next 15 and then just do the top 10 with Jamming Outdoors, Brian Absher. All in all, just remember, this is my opinion on what I like. And you're probably going to see a lot of edits because this is already looking like it's a long video. I try to sh make them as short as possible. I also tend to, especially when we're talking about games I love so much, go off on rants that don't need to be talked about. Or I feel like do not add to w letting you know whether you should try out a game or whether you like that game or not. Or whether you would like that game or not. So I end up editing out a lot of that. But And my voice starts going after a little bit. Let me know if you like these videos or not now i'm just rambling so we'll just go ahead and let you go thank you for watching and have a great day